It is now time for question period, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is to the Premier. In a statement yesterday, frontline health care workers told the Premier that thousands of Ontarians from across the province have been saying for weeks uh, about the con Conservative government's refusal to call a public inquiry. And I'm going to quote, it is clear to us that this commission can be neither truly independent nor effective if it is not structured as a full public inquiry. Delaying a public inquiry puts lives at risk. End of quote. Families, workers, and long-term care residents deserve the transparency and accountability that can only be provided by a fully independent public inquiry. Why is the Premier refusing to listen to them? The Premier. Well, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I've been in the trenches with our team for close to 70 days now, working around the clock, Saturdays, Sundays, 24-7. I'm at the hospitals, I talk to the nurses, I talk to the docs, I'm at long-term care, and what I'm hearing is continue doing what you're doing. You're being honest, you're being transparent. As soon as we found out about any of the outbreaks, First of all, my, my heart breaks for the people that have been affected, but we, we took quick action through our great leadership of our Minister of Long-Term Care, Minister of Health, again working around the clock. We put two packages of regulations together, put two emergency orders together, we increased funding by $243 million, made sure that the PPE were in the locations and if someone needed it, all they had, had to do was call and would get it there in 24 hours. But we're doing everything Response. we can, Mr. Speaker, to make sure we resolve the cases in, in the long-term care homes. The supplementary question. Speaker, with all due respect, PSWs, nurses, and other frontline workers have been in the trenches of long-term care, a broken system that has been in crisis for decades. Speaker, for decades, not 70 days, decades. The Premier says his review is going to be open and transparent, but a government commission won't have the same powers to subpoena witnesses, such as himself and his ministers, and conduct a truly independent inquiry in which frontline staff and families can say what they've been seeing and what they know is happening in long-term care. A full independent inquiry can provide timely interim reports that can be acted on, and there is nothing at all preventing this government from starting to fix the problems that exist in long-term care right now. Why is this government hiding behind a bogus delay argument and ignoring the experts, yeah. families and frontline workers, telling them to call an independent public inquiry? Uh, Premier. Through you, you, Mr. Speaker, uh, the commission that we're putting together will have witnesses, will have nurses show up, will have PSWs. We want to fix the problem. We've had this problem in Ontario for decades. It didn't just all of a sudden appear over the last six months. We're doing everything we can by making sure everything that I know or my ministers know, the public knows immediately. There's no hiding it. We have a health panel made up of some of the best doctors in the entire world, not just to mention the country that are part of the process. They're moving forward and we're fixing issues on a daily basis, not, not, not waiting for for a, an inquiry three years down the road to fix it. We're fixing it, and I'm, I'm so proud that, that, the, uh, that the team, the health team, and everyone working on it, we're the first jurisdiction in North America, in North America, to call for a transparent Response. commission to get the answers to fix the problems that have been broken for the last 20 years. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, these nurses apparently and others that the premier's planning to hand pick for his commission haven't heard from him yet he didn't talk to any health care workers that we know of about his plan for a government controlled commission and he certainly definitely didn't talk to everyday ontario families from family councils at long-term care homes to the royal canadian legion who continue to call for a full independent public inquiry who did the premier consult with speaker when deciding that a government controlled commission would be better than an independent in public inquiry. The Minister of Long Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. We're looking across the board at the, the pandemic issue in Ontario, understanding that their issues were long standing, 
but added to by COVID-19. The Public Inquiry Act includes commissions and public inquiries. The, the Commission will have public input, it will have public hearings, and there will be a public report. As the Premier has said, as I have said, there needs to be transparency. Ontarians have questions, and those questions deserve to be answered. But we must not lose scope of the importance of the solutions that we already know exist and in finding solutions to what has happened as impacted by COVID-19. The work is already Response. underway. We will add to that work. Ontarians deserve that, and questions that Ontarians have will be answered. Thank you. Next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Well, we, we know who the Premier didn't consult with before deciding his commission was good enough for Ontarians, but who the Premier is consulting with is just as concerning, Speaker. Shortly after the first COVID outbreaks in Ontario uh, that happened in nursing homes in March, or in, around March 24th, private long-term care operators began to register to lobby the government, including prominent Conservative campaign operatives and former staff to the Premier. Can the Premier tell us what conversations he and or his ministers have had with lobbyists uh, or other interests representing for-profit long-term care homes? Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again. Ontario has been tragically impacted by COVID-19. The efforts that were underway after decades of neglect of this system have been looking towards finding the solutions for the issues in long-term care. Adding to that are all the measures that our government has taken over the process of this, this horrible, unprecedented pandemic. It's a tragedy. Public Inquiry Act includes commissions and public inquiries. The Commission will be independent, it will be non-partisan, it will have public hearings, it will include public reporting, the public will have input. That is the desired transparent effort that we know Ontarians deserve. That is what we will do. Its membership is to be determined. There will be a thoughtful process. Spons? The leadership will be a thoughtful process. We must be thoughtful and non-partisan in this, and I hope that the opposition understands that. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, long-term care has tragically been impacted by profit-taking over caregiving. The families who've lost loved ones and the staff working the front lines deserve to know who the government is getting their advice from. Over the last month, Rivera Homes, where 164 residents have died, hired the Premier's former Director of Marketing and the Attorney General's former Chief of Staff to lobby on their behalf. Extendicare, who is now relying on military support in a home they manage, hired the Premier's campaign spokesperson to lobby on their behalf. Will the Premier table today details of any meetings that he and his team have had with these Conservative insiders now lobbying for for-profit private long-term care providers? Wow. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you again for the question. The issues in long-term care have been stagnating for decades. We are taking action to address the issues in long-term care. It requires many solutions. It requires the collaboration of many sectors. And as a Minister of Long-Term Care, I can tell you that we have reached out to a myriad, a variety, a tremendous variation of groups to understand what the issues are. It behooves us all to understand what the problems are so that we can find the solutions. There is, there is no smoking gun here. If there is a smoking gun, it is COVID-19. There are many people that want to be involved in providing input in something so tragic as what has happened with COVID-19. And as Minister of Long-Term Care, I value Spons? that input. Our government values that input. It's going to take everything we've got to address this issue, and we must be collaborative in this process. I hope that you can do that. The final supplementary. 
Speaker, this is nothing short of absolutely scandalous. Families with loved ones in these long-term care homes and staff struggling to this very day to access protective equipment to protect their patients and themselves have been fighting to be heard amongst this crisis. The government still denies that people are not getting the PPE that they need on the front lines. They can't afford to hire lobbyists, Speaker, but their voices matter. In fact, their voices matter the most. The Premier's plan for a government-controlled commission is going to make it even harder for everyday Ontarians to get answers. Why does the Premier think that this crisis that's been fueled by privatization can be fixed by for-profit lobbyists? Minister of Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you again for the question. Long-term care is a priority for our government. The safety and well-being of staff and residents in long-term care has been and will be the priority for this government. Looking at what has transpired with COVID-19 in long-term care homes, there are certain elements that have become clear. Our government has put up $1.75 billion to redevelop long-term care, to reform long-term care, to build the capacity that is so badly needed. It is clear when we look at the data that ward rooms played a part in this. I have said that yesterday. We are transparent about that. And we have work underway to redevelop to private or two people rooms. Yeah. We know that ward, ward rooms are a problem. Let us advance the reform of long-term care, the work that is already Response. underway and is so important for our loved ones in long-term care and those who will come after them. Understand the urgency. We need to move forward with a commission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Premier. It's sad that the Minister didn't acknowledge and the government refuses to acknowledge the clear facts that for-profit homes have had a much higher rate of deaths than not-for-profit and municipally run homes. That's something that this government needs to get its head around. Even in the midst of this crisis, though, privately owned and operated care homes have still been turning a profit. Last week, Extended Care and Siena both unveiled reports showing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue during the COVID-19 crisis, even as serious questions are being asked about care in the homes that they own and operate. What assurances can the Premier offer to families and frontline workers who can't afford Forward to hire Conservative insiders, that he is finally prepared to put care ahead of profits. The last government wouldn't do it, will he? Mr. Longford Care. Thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for the question. Now, I said yesterday in my remarks to this chamber about the need for caring and compassion. As a society, that is the essence of how we care for our most vulnerable people, and that is how we will be judged. When we look at what has happened in long-term care, there is no particular group, whether it's for-profit, not-for-profit, or for-profit, that stands out if you look at all the issues. You cannot look in a tiny lens— Order. You cannot look in a tiny lens that does not take into consideration all the different factors. If we are to be thoughtful in this process, if we are to come up with a solution for what is lacking in long-term care, then we must be thoughtful and consider all the variables, not just what is politically advantageous to the opposition. Spons. We need solutions. It's going to take many solutions, and we need to be open-minded and thoughtful about that process. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I think, this minister's I think this minister's response clearly shows why a full, independent public inquiry is necessary in the province of Ontario. That response clearly shows it. The COVID-19 crisis has devastated Order. our long-term care homes for nearly three months. Thousands of families are losing loved ones in care, and our health care heroes are giving their lives on the front lines of this fight. They see behind the scenes, privately owned and operated care homes have still been turning massive profits. Caring for our most vulnerable should not be a business. It should not be a profiteering business. So, will the Premier tell us, is he ready to reconsider the role of for-profit homes in Ontario's long-term care system? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. 
Out of respect to all the frontline workers, our PSWs, our nurses, our, our housekeepers, our cooks, our administration in long-term care, we do a disservice to them when we denigrate the sector that they work in, whether that is, whether that is for profit, not for profit. Order. We, on, we ought to be looking at finding Official opposition solutions. come to order. We need to be looking at the solutions. The commission, an independent commission, that will allow for public input, public hearings, and making sure that there is a report that is public. We need to find solutions. That's exactly what we're doing. We've put dollars behind it. We've made commitments. We've looked at uh, infection and prevention control. We've looked at making sure public health is involved in more inherently Response. in the testing. We've looked at making sure across the board that we've taken swift and decisive action, and we will continue to take swift and decisive action. <laughs> Next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, yesterday the Premier and the Minister of Education announced a very difficult decision to keep our schools closed for the remainder of the school year, as well as setting the possible timeline for the reopening of childcare centres and summer camps. For many parents and students alike, we know that this will be disappointing news because it means they won't be able to see their friends, Mr. Speaker, and their teachers in person. I know for educators, this means that they won't be able to have the person-to-person -person touch with their students. I know that the Premier and the Minister took this decision seriously and prioritized the health and safety of our students as number one. Can the Premier tell us more about why our government made this difficult decision and what supports families like those in Northumberland Peterborough South will receive while schools remain closed? Thank you, Speaker. Premier to reply. Well, th thank you, Speaker, and I, I want to thank the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South, for that important question. The safety of our kids will always be our top priority, is to protect our kids. I'm not prepared to chance it, to send the kids back to school. And another tough decision we made yesterday for a lot of the, the kids out there is overnight camps, the, the congregate situation. And we just can't chance it to have 500 kids uh, all, all living together under the, the same roof, per se, Mr. Speaker. That's why we're doing everything we can to support students and their families. Yesterday, we announced a seven-point summer learning plan and 34 partnerships with organizations and private businesses to support our students, our teachers, and our families. And I want to give a special shout out to all the teachers out there that have been going through this and online learning, along with the parents. They're, they're holding down a job and then coming home and, and helping the kids. So I just want to thank those, those two groups. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you, Premier, for that answer. Speaker, the health and safety of our young people must be the guiding principle for this government's decision making. And Speaker, I know that the Premier and Minister of Education also announced details about child care centres and camps. For many families in Northumberland, Peterborough South and across the province, child care centres and camps play an important role supporting families and children alike. We know that the safe and gradual reopening of the economy needs to go hand in hand with the safe and gradual reopening of child care centres. Speaker, can the Premier tell us about the government's decision on child care centres and camps? Thank you. Premier. I, I want to thank the member for that, for that question. Yesterday, we, we announced that based on the expert advice from the Chief Medical Officer of Health and COVID Command Table, that child care centres will reopen in Stage 2, Mr. Speaker. We also announced that as long as the trends continue to improve, summer camps, day camps, with strict, strict guidelines in July and August, uh, will reopen. Mr. Speaker, families need certainty. They want to know what they're doing throughout the summer, uh, where they're going, making plans with the family. Now we've given them certainty so they can move forward in a safe manner to protect their kids, to protect the families. And that's what we've been doing from day one. Number one priority. My, my job is to protect the 14.5 million people right here in Ontario, and I'm going to continue doing that, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for London West. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier stated that he didn't want to delay urgent reforms desperately needed in long-term care. Speaker, he doesn't have to delay. The personal support workers who care for our loved ones deserve better wages, and not just during the pandemic. They deserve full-time jobs at one facility, instead of cobbling together multiple part-time shifts, potentially spreading infection from one home to the next. This was a recommendation of the SARS Commission and it's the right thing to do. Speaker, will the government act right now to permanently increase PSW wages and mandate permanent one facility staffing placements in long term care? Minister Long Term Care to reply. And thank you for the question. I don't think my mic is on. There we go. Uh, so thank you for the question. Looking at the elements of neglect over the last 15 years, a couple decades, our government was actively working on finding those solutions. Staffing was part of that. When COVID hit, we've taken even more measures, introducing the pandemic pay to which you refer. Our intent is to address with our expert panel uh, the staffing issues that have been long neglected and that we need to address on an urgent basis. Their work is ongoing, and uh, I will value their, uh, their informed uh, input. Looking at the pandemic pay, we understand the, the gaps that are, are existing uh, in long-term care and other sectors. We need to attract people to long-term care. There are, many, there are many reasons why uh, that gap exists and why there is a lack of staff, and all of that will be addressed. Thank you. The supplementary question, the member for Nickel Belt. To the Premier, there are other reforms that the government could implement today one that is very close to my heart is a minimum standard of four hours of hands-on care. It would make such a huge difference to the quality of care to our loved ones in long-term care. The Premier does not have to wait to enact this. We are ready, willing and able today to work with the government to expedite and pass Bill 13, the Time to Care Act, and make a minimum standard of four hours of hands-on care a reality today, this afternoon. We can let our long-term care hero know that we have their backs and that these needed change will be made permanent. Will the Premier work with the opposition, pass Bill 13, the Time to Care Act, legislate a minimum standard of four hours of hands-on care and the employment standard for long-term care hero? Premier, we could do this today. Will you do this with us? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for, for your question. Looking at the care in our long-term care homes, as soon as we became a dedicated ministry in the summer of last year, we looked at resident-centred care. Our vision was for a 21st century long-term care system uh, that was rehabilitated modern design standards, more care around the residents. And this is something that we're addressing and have been addressing to make care more resident-centered. And that means looking at ways that care is provided in the home, looking at ways new models like the butterfly model can enhance the support for our residents and make the work for staff um, meaningful and purposeful in a different way. And so that work is already underway. Uh, lo looking at red tape reduction, looking at the highly regulated sector that long-term care is, and how we create the en Response. environment whereby we can have staff more interacting with residents, providing that direct care. This is ongoing, and we will continue to work on this. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, in March, the College of Physicians and Surgeons launched a program to issue short-term short -term licenses to allow some foreign-trained doctors and domestic medical school graduates to practice under supervision. But it's my understanding that by April of this year, only 12 people applied. In April, the government announced a program to help former international health care providers and medical students connect with institutions to offer additional support. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the minister. Can the minister update this House to whether the program has been successful and how many international medical professionals have applied and been approved? 
Questions to the Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for the question, and I would say that with the COVID pandemic, we have been welcoming people from, with health care backgrounds of all sorts. We have asked for people to join as uh, through a volunteer line. We also have a connection panel that connected people, organizations that were looking for help with people who were ready to volunteer. We had a, many, many nurses who came forward out of retirement who uh, worked with the College of Nurses to be recertified. We had many internationally trained medical graduates who came forward as well, who have been very helpful in numerous areas, including contact tracing, working at the assessment centres and elsewhere. So while I have had a number of inquiries from them about their ability to go immediately to the College of Physicians and Surgeons to be certified, we all know that there is a process that has to be followed, but I'm sure that their experience Response. locally is going to be of assistance to them. But of course, that's going to be up to the College of Physicians and Surgeons to make that final decision. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Minister, um, 12 applications is simply not good enough. Uh, in Ontario today, we've got 13,000 foreign trained doctors, 6,000 foreign trained nurses in Ontario today. And we know that 10% of the COVID cases are healthcare professionals. The system is being pushed to the brink. It is completely unacceptable to leave those professionals on the sideline and waste that talent. Minister, would you consider running some type of public awareness campaign to get the word out there so we can increase those applicants and get people working? It is a waste of those resources. Minister? I only agree with you that we don't want to waste any valuable health care resources that we have, and I know that there are many internationally trained graduates who are ready to work in Ontario. There are also a number of uh, students from Canada who've gone to do their residency in, in the United States, for example, who want to come back to be able to work. There are many, many people that are in that situation. So we certainly want to encourage them to apply to the College of Physicians and Surgeons, and we're continuing our conversation with the college as well. But ultimately, they need to be qualified to practice in Ontario. We need to have those standards met. But uh, there is more work to do, absolutely, because we don't want those resources to go to waste. So thank you for bringing the question forward. Next, we have the question from the member for Ottawa South. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Premier, last week I asked you about ongoing testing and long-term care, and the response that we received was that we were going to test every resident and staff by this week. And I think we'd all agree that's a good thing. It's just a snapshot. COVID-19 is not going away anytime soon. And long-term care, retirement, and group homes are where we know we're the most vulnerable. There needs to be a plan. So through you, Speaker, I'll ask the Premier again, what is the plan for ongoing testing and surveillance in long-term care, retirement, and group homes? Thank you. Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for this question. This is a really important issue because we know that testing is a snapshot. And it's not something to say that we've got all the residents of long-term care homes tested and that's the end of it. That's going to need to continue on an ongoing basis, as well as the continued uh, testing of staff members as well. Uh, and as we contemplate at some stage for family members to be able to come into, that introduces another element of concern and risk. So we will need to have heightened testing in those areas. But we have completed the testing on a, on a first case basis uh, through long-term care homes, residents and staff. We are moving now forward with retirement homes, group homes, shelters and, and other places of congregate living. That's very important. And again, that will have to continue to be monitored. Response. And testing will need to continue there. But we know that the ongoing testing is also very important in the community as well as certain elements of the economy open up. So we are concentrating on uh, testing in that area as well. Supplementary question. And uh, I appreciate the answer, Minister, and the commitment to ongoing testing. You know, I, I think we need a plan because as we're opening up this economy, we know the pressures that existed around community and testing going on in the community and not in long-term care. And we didn't use capacity when we had it. And that's, that's just a fact. Now we know that in this pandemic that we're gonna need more testing and more surveillance. 
that's what experts tell us. That's what we're going to have to do as we open up the economy. And let's be frank, we're not there. We're not there yet. We know that. So I just want to reiterate that, we, that it needs to be a clear plan. Because if we tilt too heavy on one side, as we may have, understandably, I'm not, not criticizing that decision. We should maybe look at that. But let's make sure that we tilt the right way. Because if we don't, it's going to have really serious consequences for people living in long-term care, retirement, Question. and group homes. So, Minister, uh, it needs, there needs to be a clear plan, and there is not one yet. Thank you. Minister of Health. I can agree with you that there is a need for a plan. There is a need to uh, have ongoing testing, and there is a plan. We do have a plan. We focused initially on making sure that the most vulnerable group was being protected. That's our long-term care residents and staff. We also know that another very vulnerable group is people in retirement homes and other congregate living places. That's what we're focusing our attention on now with ongoing testing in long-term care homes. We're doing the surveillance testing in the public, and we've also changed the criteria, though, for people who are symptomatic, who do have symptoms that they believe might be COVID-19. They may go to assessment centres now, and they will be tested. Previously, it was more up to the judgment of the clinician at the assessment centre. What we are saying now as we're opening up the economy is if you have symptoms of COVID-19, please go to an assessment centre and be tested. That is vitally important so that we can assess the community impact uh, on public health Response. of the opening of the economy. So we really urge people to go to the assessment centres for a test if they believe they have symptoms of COVID-19. Next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. There's nothing more important than a worker going to work and feeling safe. That was true before this pandemic, and it's true more now than ever. But in Ontario, this is not happening. Mr. Speaker, 17% of Ontario confirmed cases are healthcare workers, a 10% jump from cases in early April. Nurses, doctors, lab technicians, PSWs, therapists, custodians, and many more among our frontline heroes who are getting sick. In some cases, they do everything right, and they still not prevent this deadly virus. But in some cases, they can. Mr. Speaker, we've heard it from the front lines. They need more PPE, and they need the right PPE. When will these frontline heroes get the equipment Question. they need to stay safe themselves when they're keeping us safe? Thank you. Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much to the member for this question. It is vitally important that we have people who are bravely going to work each and every day. They are frontline heroes, our doctors, our nurses, our personal support workers, cleaners, kitchen staff, everyone that's working in health care. They deserve to be protected with the right personal protective equipment. And we have been working day and night. The Premier has been working on this each and every day to make sure that we bring personal protective equipment in through our regular supply sources, but also through Ontario together, we have been able to work with Ontario companies to produce PPE so that we never have to be in a situation again where de we're dependent on imports from another country because there's been international demand for PPE. So we are creating it. There are companies now producing disinfectant and gowns and masks and face shields. Response. All of this equipment is vitally important to protect those heroes on the front line for, for themselves and for their families' health as well. And the supplementary question. Minister, I just want to say to you, in my own writing, I have PSWs, custodians, that are in ICUs on ventilators as we speak today because they weren't provided proper PPE. I just want you to know that that's happening. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, keeping workers safe must be a priority of this government. And one of the ways to do that is for people who feel unsafe be able to refuse unsafe work. Early in this pandemic, the Premier said, and I will quote, if you don't feel safe in the workplace, your job will be protected. You can leave the job site. So my question is simple. What has the government actually done to protect workers 
who are trusting their premier and taking his advice. Mr. Labor to reply. Well, I want to thank uh, the member opposite uh, for that question. Uh, the health and safety of workers in this province is uh, the top priority for me as minister and for our government. Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm proud of the uh, very first piece of legislation that we introduced in the House uh, when the uh, global COVID-19 pandemic uh, broke out. It was supported by uh, every member in this House. That was Bill 186. That legislation uh, told workers that if they uh, are in self-isolation, if they're in quarantine, if you're a mom or a dad or an aunt or an uncle that has to stay home and look after uh, a child because uh, the education uh, system is shut down, that those jobs will be protected. And Mr. Speaker, furthermore, I want to give a shout out to every Ministry of Labour inspector who's on the ground every single day. I'm proud to report that nearly 7,500 workplace investigations have been done. Uh, nearly 3,500 orders have been issued. And Mr. Speaker, we've had to shut down 20 job sites. We will spend uh, every resource necessary to protect every single worker in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, late last week, the government quietly published a regulation that allows large polluters to be exempted from normal GHG reporting timeline requirements. And since the government suspended the environmental oversight rules last month, they were able to make this change without notice or public consultation. Transparent GHG reporting rules allow us to hold government accountable and polluters accountable. And it makes no sense to suspend pollution um, uh, reporting during a pandemic, especially when experts now are drawing a link between air pollution and vulnerability to COVID-19. So, Speaker, why does the minister think that a global pandemic during a health crisis is the right time to suspend transparent reporting requirements for climate pollution? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thanks very much uh, for the question from the member opposite. And Mr. Speaker, uh, early in the pandemic, uh, we moved to uh, ensure that we were able to react and continue the supply chain within this government, within this province during the pandemic. And at that time, uh, we suspended the 30-day uh, consultation period on the EBR uh, in order to ensure that uh, we can keep people supplied with food and keep people safe, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in relation to the question, member opposite about the greenhouse gas uh, reporting, obviously it wasn't hidden, it was posted on the EBR, um, so it was public for everybody. And what that whole idea was, was to line up the reporting structure for industry in Ontario with the changes the federal government did because of the pandemic by extending it by one month. One month to report that. So we didn't want to overburden industry in this, this province, which is having a hard time bringing in the people to do the reporting because Response. of the pandemic. And instead, we made it easier to do one report that fits in line with the province in Canada. I'm not sure if the member opposite really cares about businesses during this pandemic, but we do, and we're making sure that they can survive and make it through this day. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like the minister to know that in the regulation, it does not specify one month. It says for an indeterminate period of time. Huh. I would say if anybody has been fighting for businesses in this pandemic, it's been me calling for a ban on commercial rent evictions over and over again yeah, to stand yeah. up for our small businesses. Speaker, I'm concerned that the government doesn't understand or hasn't considered how this change could affect our obligations under the Paris Agreement. And I've complimented the government and indeed all members of this House for quarantining partisanship during this pandemic. But I'm concerned that the government could be using the COVID crisis to undermine environmental protections. Numerous Question. consumer groups have expressed concerns about this. So will the minister consider bringing back the Environmental Bill of Rights so we have public oversight on essential Thank you very much. <laughs> Minister of the Environment. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and the member opposite knows that my door is open if he does have certain questions. It's, it's a month. Um, but anyways, he's, he's, Mr. Speaker, I, 
I, I kind of see this member as he's growing in his in his role in the legislature. He's becoming a politician in sheep's clothing. He comes across as this gentle person coming forward. But at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, Order. he's playing par politics. He's playing partisanship. When I first suspended the EBR, he was on Twitter saying, you know, there's no ill will behind it. Good for him. Order. Special interest groups get a hold of him, all of a sudden it's bad. Mr. Speaker, we have allowed through this, this process to make sure farmers continue food supply with the nutrient management would have been suspended if we didn't act, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have GHG reporting, which is online for people to read at, Mr. Speaker. Because of COVID-19, we have an amendment to the ESA Act with forestry, but we are allowing a 30-day consultation Response. period, Mr. Speaker. We are being pragmatic to ensure Ontarians are safe. Our supply chain is ongoing. I wish the member opposite would join on board and support this government, work with us to have us defeat this pandemic and get the economy up and running again. Order. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Minister of Health continued to claim that Ontario is a global leader in COVID-19 testing. But here are the facts. Ontario's per capita testing for COVID-19 ranks fifth in Canada, behind Quebec, Nova Scotia, Alberta, and the Northwest Territories. Ontario is also behind a wide swath of countries, including even the United States. Ontario has consistently missed its own testing targets, including by 5,000 or more tests on 21 separate occasions since mid-April. And today, once again, we've just received a report that Ontario has only completed 7,300 tests yesterday. That's 10,000 fewer tests than the daily target. Why does this government continue to claim that this is a success? Mr. Health, to reply. Uh, because it is a success. When we started out, the only testing that was being done Order. was being do done through Public Health Ontario. We've since expanded that to over 20 sites, including hospital labs, labs in uh, other uh, private labs that are doing some of the testing, uh, university labs as well. We've created a connected system of labs where one did not exist before, unlike, for example, in Alberta. They got out early, but we did that and because we have now been able to do up to 20,000 tests per day. Does that ebb and flow a bit? Yes, it does. Let's look at what just happened. We just had a long weekend that just went by where people were not, some went to assessment centres, but not as many as have been going to assessment centres. We also had a situation where we finished our testing in long-term care homes, and we're transitioning now to do testing in retirement homes, Response. other places of congregate living, and more testing in the public. That's what's really important is to do that testing and to make sure if people have symptoms of COVID-19, please go to an assessment centre and you will be Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And respectfully, I think I have a different definition for the word success than the minister. The importance of testing cannot be overstated. Epidemiologists have said that the best testing strategy is to test, test, and test some more. It helps our scientists and healthcare heroes contain the virus by tracking where it is. In the last two days, Ontario has completed less than 15,000 tests. In the last week, Ontario averaged under 14,000 tests a day. That's a far cry from the 20,000 that the Premier and the Minister said we would be completing. We've only reached capacity for the lab system once, one time, once, since April 15th. What can Ontarians themselves, what can Ontarians, everyday Ontarians do to help this government get more tests completed so that we can tackle this virus together? Minister. Well, one thing I could agree with the member on, that testing is very important, especially as we're opening our economy. We need to understand what the effect is on public health. But what I don't, dis don't agree with is the uh, testing strategy and where Ontario stands vis-a-vis -vis the rest of Canada. We continue to remain the province that has the highest testing per 100,000 people across this entire country, despite starting off at a situation that was less than ideal compared to some of the other provinces. So we are still doing that. Do we hit those targets every single day? No. There is an ebb and flow to this, but we are increasing our capacity on a daily basis. The last couple of days have been slower than usual, but we are continuing to increase the lab testing capability. Part of it is that the same number of people did not come to the assessment centres over the weekend. We want people 
to come in. We are going to obviously people are going Response. to do that willingly. So what we are doing now is encouraging people to come in if they have symptoms of COVID-19. We want them to come into assessment centres to be tested. That is vitally important for us to determine when we can enter the next stage of opening our economy. If Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No. The next question. Next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In 2014, researchers found that racialized and black Ontarians were more at risk of acquiring H1N1. Despite knowing this, the Liberal government did next to nothing tangible to address health inequities. As of last week, government data collected on COVID-19 infections among um, Ontario healthcare workers excluded personal support workers from the categories being tracked. The vast majority of PSWs are black, brown, and racialized women. That data simply did not matter to this government. The Premier said he didn't believe in race-based data, but now, after intense public pressure, says that race-based data can be voluntarily collected during the pandemic. He has shared no plan on how this data will be used to keep black, brown, indigenous, and other racialized people safe, both during and after the pandemic. Speaker, my question is simple. What is the plan? Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. It is an important one. And as the current situation evolves, we are committed to ensuring that we have the important health information and data that we need to ensure the health and safety of all Ontarians. And this is something that has evolved since the beginning of this pandemic. The ministry does not routinely collect data on income or race in lab data or in IFAS or COVID-19. But we want to understand the issues of inequity that have been brought forward to us by a number of groups. We know that the understanding how the corona pandemic is spread, who it's affecting, what needs to be done as a result of that requires us to collect this data. So we are going to do it because we want to make sure that we can keep all Ontarians healthy and safe. So has this been a change Response. since the beginning? Yes, it has. Certain things have evolved as the course of this pandemic, and this is now something we are committed to collecting and, and using to improve everyone's health outcomes. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, health inequities existed before COVID-19, and they will exist after. Data collection with no plan for how to use the information responsibly is actually not what people are asking for. People are asking this government to create a plan to address the health inequities that so many of us as Black, racialized and Indigenous people experience whenever we interact with the healthcare system. From having to convince someone that symptoms are real, to finding culturally responsive mental health services, to being misdiagnosed and having our pain left unaddressed. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I'll ask again, will this government make an informed plan to address health inequities in our health care system even when the pandemic is over? And will they commit today to sharing that plan publicly? And Minister of Health. Well, I certainly can agree with the member that there are inequities in other areas of health care as well. It's one of the things that we took a look at in developing our mental health plan, recognizing that not everyone's needs were being met and that the need to expand the system and consider the perspectives of everyone in Ontario. That is something that we hope to do with respect to the work that we're doing on COVID-19 as well. And the anti-racism directorate is supporting the implementation of a framework to collect race-based data and to make sure that it is collected, that it's protected and used in a standardized way across certain sectors of government, because that also is going to be very important, not just to collect the data, but to make sure that it is protected for privacy reasons and used appropriately. So we are working with the directorate to do that. And the directorate is developing culturally Response. appropriate training resources to support regulated child welfare, justice and education sectors with the implementation of race-based data collection. So there is a lot of work that's ongoing. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. This week, the government officially moved into their first stage of reopening, allowing retail stores and public spaces to reopen in some instances. But this week, the spread of COVID-19 continues to increase. 
The people of Ontario have taken dramatic steps and cooperated with emergency order on, on a historic level. They do not want to squander their hard-won progress on a second wave of infections and closures. Speaker, through you to the minister, to prevent a second wave, we need to be more data-driven. We currently do not have all public health units collecting workplace data of infected persons. Without a more robust data collection system in place, our response to a second wave will look more like playing a game of whack-a-mole blindfolded. Will the government invest Question. more in local public health units across the province so that we can track COVID-19 and contain spread? The Minister of Health. Well, thank you. I thank the member very much for that question. It is something that is very important. We have already put uh, $75 million into uh, public health units to help them to do more testing and to uh, do the contact tracing and all of the other work that needs to be done. But you're absolutely right. As we open up the economy, we want to make sure that we understand what the effect is on public health. I can tell you that I, uh, that's something that's being followed very closely by our Chief Medical Officer of Health, who was the one that ultimately um, looked at the plan that we had developed and put certain standards in place and was, uh, was fine with the opening of the stage one yesterday. That said, we need to follow very carefully to see what happens in the next several weeks. That's why this has to be done in very careful, measured stages to make sure that we can Response. follow what's happening. If there's some suggestion that public health is being affected in a negative way, then we need to pause, analyze the data, and make changes to it. The supplementary question. Speaker, I thank the minister for her response, and I do have a suggestion. We know that asymptomatic spread is an ongoing concern, and many sectors rely on public health measures involving symptomatic screening and advising folks to stay home if they feel sick. But when we're reopening, this isn't good enough to give people the confidence that they need. Experts have warned that our asymptomatic spread will be a blind spot if we do not broaden our testing capability. Weeks will pass, and then new infections will be found. Mr. Speaker, to get our economy back, we need that confidence to be in place to prevent a second wave of spread. Will the minister commit to investing more in broad-based, rigorous testing and contact tracing Question. in areas of possible risk? For instance, bus drivers, limo drivers, taxi drivers, grocery store clerks, childcare workers, and not just in areas already in outbreak, so we give people more Thank you. Thank you. The Minister of Health to reply. Thank you very much. Well, you're absolutely right. We do need to do more broad-based screening. That's why we're inviting people to please, if you have any symptoms of COVID-19, go and be assessed. But we need to have surveillance testing done as well. So we're looking at expanding that because we are working with businesses. The Jobs and Recovery Committee that is being chaired by the Minister of Finance is taking a look at it, figuring out with businesses how are they going to bring employees back for the next stage as we get to that point. How are they going to uh, let people come back to work? Because people are nervous about this. While they want to go back to work, they're concerned about it. They're concerned about their own health, their, their uh, group, the people that they work with. So we are working with businesses to determine how they are going to do their own testing and how that will continue with the work that we're doing as well. So it is a complicated process. We are working on that Response. now because we do want to get to stage two uh, at the next uh, point in time, but it needs to be safe for all Ontarians. So we're working with businesses and some of the broader uh, sector organizations to allow that. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. My question this morning is to the Premier. Uh, Premier, the owners of Brosnan Retirement Incorporated in Hamilton have a spotty history, to say the least. They have a license that was revoked because of substandard care, a bankruptcy, and a Hamilton Spectator investigation showing that the health ministry provided more than $500 million to the company leading up to the bankruptcy. Yet they're now running at least eight retirement homes in Hamilton and Dundas, including the Roslyn home that was evacuated on Friday. They had every resident evacuated to the hospital because of a, of a horrific COVID-19 outbreak. And unbelievably, uh, one resident was left behind in the empty home. 
forgotten. This is truly a nightmare. So my question to the Premier is simple. Why doesn't he take action when private, for-profit corporations take advantage and hurt our seniors? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. We have been diligently monitoring and taking uh, decisive actions to stop the spread of COVID-19. And uh, it is true that there were steps taken to evacuate the uh, Rosslyn Retirement Home last week due to concerns about the, uh, the physical structure and that to, to keep people safe and healthy. We are also aware that a resident was left behind in the house for 24 hours. That is not acceptable under any terms, not acceptable at all. Um, and we um, are working with our partners to review the protocols to understand why this could have happened and to make sure that this never happens again. But we, the Retirement Regulatory Homes Authority has been working closely with the local LIN and with the public health units to understand what has been happening and to make sure that as the people have been evacuated, that Response. they are going to be safe and healthy in, the, in their new home for the time being. But the other situation was totally unacceptable and um, certainly should not have happened. A supplementary question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, last Sunday, a constituent of mine, Christine Collins, wrote to you on behalf of her brother, Peter, calling for a public inquiry into long-term care. Peter lives at the Carling View Manor, a for-profit long-term care home in Ottawa, where tragically 46 people have died. And Speaker, earlier in debate, the minister responsible for this file said that when we question, as an opposition, some for-profit uh, operating homes, we're insulting the workers. I beg through you, Speaker, for the minister to understand what's insulting is for CEOs in this industry to earn more in a year than workers do, at more in a day, excuse me, than workers do in an entire year. Christine is terrified for her brother's safety, Premier. The staff in this place are overworked. They've been going seven days a week for six weeks. His medications, she worries, are not being properly followed. Premier, Christine wants a public inquiry. So witnesses are compelled to testify, and she gets the answers that her family urgently needs. Will you please abide by Christine and so many other wishes and call for a public independent inquiry? Yes or no? Minister of Long-Term Care reply. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Looking at the long-term care homes across Ontario, our government has been doing everything to support them, and Carling View included. We've worked across ministries, we've worked with a number of other groups, whether it's the uh, Ontario Health, whether it's Public Health, whether it's the LINs, whether it's the local hospitals, engaging support for these homes. And Carling View is one of the homes that has received that support. And my heart goes out to all the family members who are suffering through this, all the residents who are you know, at the, bearing the brunt of this. There's, it's, it's fact. Carling View Manor has received help from the Queensway Carleton Hospital. It's received help from the Ontario Health Response Team. It is getting support, and that matters most. Our government has made the priority a, a, a long-term care, the residents, the staff, and that's exactly what we're doing. In terms of a public inquiry, I want to reiterate it will be public. There will be public hearings. There will be a public report. There will be public input. It is under the Public Inquiries Act, both public inquiries and this commission, which will be independent and nonpartisan. We must have transparency. Our government wants transparency. Response. As a minister, I want transparency. Ontarians have answers, and those answers deserve those questions deserve to be answered. The Ontarians have questions. The next question, the member for Markham Unionville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Mr. Premier. Premier, during this time, many of my constituents have to make sacrifices as we all adjust to the new normal. This is something that all Ontarians we had to experience with changes to our regular routine impacting each individual's and spiritual and religious practices. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the importance that the religious organizations has played during this time. Churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, uh, Gurdwaras are all places of connection of fellowship that has been required to shut down to help fight the spread of this pandemic. Speaker, can the Premier please share this uh, with the legislature about the new regulations that the government announced yesterday that will provide better clarification for places of worship in this province? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Premier to reply. Well, I want, I want to thank the, the member from Markham Unionville for the, for the question. Our government recognizes the importance Ontarians place in participating in religious gatherings. It's absolutely critical that we move forward with this, and we, and we did. That's why our government amended the regulations to allow Ontarians to attend religious gatherings in the following conditions. Individuals must remain in a car. Individuals may only be in a vehicle with others if they are part of the same household. Cars must be at least two metres apart. No materials can be passed between individuals during the service, and persons conducting the gatherings must ensure uh, buildings are close for, for service, so they can't open their buildings, people can't be going in there and using the, the restrooms. Our government and all members greatly appreciate the sacrifices made by all religious communities regarding social distancing measures while still serving their communities with compassion during this time. And the supplementary question. Premier, thank you for the answer in our, our government's Sun's announcement on greater clarity regarding public worship. I know that my constituents, as well as many people in this province, greatly appreciate hearing this news and the continued support that we are providing to religious organizations with measures like this. Premier, religious, spirit, uh, ritual, uh, religious and spiritual organizations play a major role in lives of many Ontarians. During this pandemic, we have seen all major states demonstrate countless examples of leadership and personal sacrifice in order to help each other. Speaker, can the Premier share with the Legislature about the positive support that all religious communities in Ontario has demonstrated during this time? Premier. I want to thank the member for the question. I want to take an opportunity to acknowledge the, the work done by all religious communities across this province. I experienced it uh, numerous times, but just a couple days ago, I was at a mosque handing out meals thousands of meals as people were, were driving through. This includes examples of live stream servicing, services be, being provided during Ramadan, Passover, Vasaki, or Easter, allowing religious members to stay connected in faith and fellowship while making sure they ensure that social distancing measures have been respected. The actions, Mr. Speaker, of all religious communities truly demonstrate the Ontario spirit of charity, compassion, and support, those in need, no matter who they are or what religion they come from. Thank you. This host stands adjourned until Tuesday, May the 26th at 9 a.m. Keep well, stay safe, and take care.